Good evening, and welcome to Episode 3 of Mortar and Pestle Productions Radio Classics. Each episode features a Golden Age radio drama script performed live by our very own Mortar and Pestle Theatre Company alumni here in Toronto. For tonight's show, we have chosen a classic Sherlock Holmes mystery entitled The Musgrave Ritual. Written for radio by Edith Miser, based on the story by Sir Conan Arthur Doyle, and originally broadcast on the 11th of December, 1939. By order of appearance, tonight's cast features Melissa Beveridge as Knox Manning, Kyle Frank as Dr. Watson and Brunton, Matt Van Steenberg as Sherlock Holmes, Brian Fairbrother as Reginald Musgrave, Oral Speakwell as Alfred the Butler, Rachel Salzberg as Rachel Howells, and Alfonso Bernschnark and Cademan Ricker Wilson performing closing announcements. And so, without further ado, we proudly present Mortar and Pestle's production of The Musgrave Ritual. <laughs> The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Matt Van Steenberg and Kyle Frank. And now, here we are, seated once more in Dr. Watson's study. The good doctor is wandering aimlessly about the room, tidying objects on his desk, straightening a row of books. Well, Dr. Watson, you certainly have a passion for law and order. A place for everything and everything in its place, I always say. I do hate a mess. Holmes, on the contrary, was one of the untidiest men that ever drove a fellow lodger to desperation. When I find a man who keeps his cigars in a coal scuttle, his tobacco in the end of a Persian slipper, and his unanswered correspondence transfixed by a jackknife in the very center of a wooden mantelpiece, then I begin to give myself virtuous airs. (laughs) And of course that annoyed Sherlock Holmes. No, he never even noticed it. Well, now, let me see. Last time, I think I promised that this week's story would be the Musgrave Ritual. The Musgrave Ritual? What was that? Patience, Miss Manning, patience. Well, as I was saying, Holmes was very untidy. Our chambers were always full of chemicals and criminal relics. But his papers were my greatest trial. He had a horror of destroying documents. Once a year or so, I would browbeat him into docketing and cataloging them. One winter night... As we sat together by the fire, Holmes playing casual chords on his violin, I ventured to suggest that he might spend his time more profitably by making our sitting room a little more habitable. Oh, stop that racket, will you? Why don't you do something worthwhile instead of lolling around like that? For instance? Well, you could straighten up this room. It looks more like a pigsty every day. Hmm. Oh, very well. Now, where are you going? Look at this place. Papers on the table, papers on the floor, papers on the chairs, papers... Uh, What are you doing, Holmes? Pulling that large tin box in here. House cleaning. The key. Oh, yes. And what have you got in there? Cases. Records of some of my earlier cases. Done, well, prematurely. (laughs) Before I had such a competent biographer, I think if you knew what I had in this box, you'd ask me to pull some out instead of putting others in. No, no, it's no use, Holmes. You can't get round me like that. You might just as well begin putting your stuff away. Hmm. Here's the record of the Tarleton murders. The case of the Vanbury. Huh. The adventure of the Russian woman and the singular affair of the aluminium crutch. Aluminium crutch? Yes, a most amazing story. It was one April day. The rain was coming down in torrents. Uh, no, no, I'm not interested. I ho, oh, well, I suppose I'd best get back to work. Ah, here. Now here really is something a little recherche. But it's nothing but a wooden box with a sliding lid. But look inside. Come on, look inside. All right. Hmm. A a crumpled piece of paper with some doggerel written on it, an old-fashioned brass key, a peg of wood with a ball of string attached, and three rusty old discs of metal. 
Not very impressive, Holmes. Well, what do you make of it? It's nothing but a strange collection. And there is a stranger story connected with it. Huh. I suspected these relics had a history. They are history, my dear Watson. They are history. Well, what was it about? These are all I have left to remind me of the Musgrave rituals. Fascinating case. Oh, fascinating. Hi, her. Well, I guess I'd better be getting on with my work. Hmm. Well, go on then. What was the Musgrave ritual? You want to interrupt my labors with a silly story and leave all this litter as it is? Reprehensible, my dear Watson. Thoroughly reprehensible. Oh, Holmes. Go on and get on with the story. Very well. It was one of my first cases when I was making a most precarious living out of my sleuthing. It had to do with Reginald Musgrave, a scion of one of the oldest families in the kingdom. Well, I hadn't seen Reginald Musgrave for several years until one morning I received a note from him. Ah, here it is. <clears> hmm. <throat> my dear Sherlock, I hear that you are turning to practical ends these powers with which you use to analyze us. Could you spare time to visit us at Hurlstone? I can promise you a problem which will tax even your nimble wits. Hopefully yours, Reggie Musgrave. You can imagine my eagerness. In my innermost heart, I believed that I could succeed where others had failed. <laughs> Conceit. Don't interrupt, Watson. Don't interrupt. Well, late that night, I arrived at Hurlstone to find myself enthusiastically greeted by mine host. Well, Holmes, delighted to see you, my dear fellow. It's awfully good of you to come. You've gotten taller and thinner than ever. You're much the same, I should say, Musgrave. Alfred, carry Mr. Holmes' bags up to his room. Yes, sir. Your butler is new at his job, isn't he? Yes, but how did you know? His uniform is a rather bad fit, and his legs are better suited to the stable yard than the drawing room. Well, as a matter of fact, he's just been promoted to his post. He, he used to be the head coachman. It's about Brunson, our old butler, that I wanted to see you. And what about him? Well, he, he's disappeared. Brunson's disappeared, eh? Seems to me I've heard you mention his name before. I dare say you have. He's been in service here for nearly 20 years, although he's barely 40 now. Rather unusual. Yes. Uh, well, he was a young school teacher out of place when he was first taken up by my father. He was a man of great ability, handsome, spoke several languages, played every musical instrument, a paragon. But Brunton had only one fault. Oh, yes. He was a bit of a Don Juan. A few months ago, we were in hope that he was about to settle down, for he became engaged to Rachel Howells, our second maid. Well? Well, he has since thrown her over and taken up with the daughter of the head gamekeeper. And what was this girl Rachel like? Rachel is a very good girl, but of an excitable temperament. Uh, she had a touch of brain fever subsequent to the smash-up of a romance. I'm really rather worried about the girl. Yes, but look here, Musgrave. You haven't brought me all the way from London to discuss a servant girl's love affairs. Well, that was her first drama at Hurlstone. Quite a tempest in a teapot it was. You know what country houses are like. But a second one came to drive it from our minds. It was prefaced by the disgrace and dismissal of our butler, Brunton. Dismissal? Yes. Uh, one night last week, uh, Thursday to be exact, I found that I couldn't sleep. Well, you know how it is. Well, at two o'clock in the morning, I rose and lit a candle, intending to get a novel that I'd been reading in the library. I pulled on my dressing gown and started down the stairs. Well, imagine my surprise when, looking down the corridor, I saw a glimmer of light coming from the library door. My first thought was of burglars. Luckily, our corridors are liberally decorated with trophies and old weapons. I seized a battle axe in either hand and tiptoed down the hall to the library door. Don't move if you value your life. Oh, sir. But, 
Why, God bless me, it's Brunston. What are you doing down here in the middle of the night? Well, you see, sir, I, uh... And my desk has been broken into. And my private papers strewn about the table. What do you mean going through my private papers? You scoundrel! After all the trust we've had in you. Well, sir, I, uh, I meant no harm. The impudence! The rank impudence, Brunton! You will leave my service tomorrow. Oh, d- Mr. Musgrave, sir, I, I can't bear the disgrace. I've always been proud about my station in life. And look what it has led you to. The disgrace will kill me, sir. At least at least let me give you notice, and, and leave in a month's time, as if it was of my own free will. Very well. Um, but a month is too long. Take yourself off in a week and give whatever reasons you wish for going. Only a week? Oh, no. A fortnight. At least say a fortnight. A week. And you've been let off very lightly. Now put down the paper you have in your hand and get out. And after that little set to, you were too annoyed to sleep, eh, Musgrave? Well, as a matter of fact, I did spend the rest of the night thinking of things I should have said to the fellow. However, by morning I had calmed down somewhat. And Brunton? Well, for two days afterwards, Brunton was most assiduous in his attention to his duties. On the third day, he was gone. Gone? Gone where? Deuce take it. That's what I would like to know. His bed had not been slept in, but all our windows and doors were found locked on the inside, and no one had let him out. Did you question this girl, Rachel? Yes. She's been very ill ever since his disappearance. Sometimes hysterical. I had to have a nurse sit up with her at night. What was the condition of Brunton's room after the disappearance? Oh, very orderly, as usual. His clothes, his watch, even his money were in the room, but but the black suit he usually wore was missing. His slippers, too, were gone, but not his boots. Enlightening. Most enlightening. And what was the paper he had in his hand when you surprised him in the library? It was the Musgrave Ritual. The Musgrave Ritual? Well, what is that? Oh, it's a rather absurd business. Uh, It's only its antiquity to excuse it. It's a strange sort of catechism which each Musgrave must answer when he comes of age. Could I see it? Yes, certainly, certainly. It's in the library. Come this way. Hmm. This old hall is rather impressive with all its armor and weapons. Wait! Fancy I heard someone on the stairs. Someone on tiptoe. I'll run up and have a look. Be careful, my dear fellow. Be careful. No, there's no one here. Strange. I would have sworn I heard footsteps. Must have been the old stairs creaking. Ah, this is a library, and this is the desk where I keep my private papers. How private? I mean, is there anything there that would benefit anyone else? Oh, good heavens, no. Nothing that might lead to blackmail. (laughs) No, sorry to disappoint you, Holmes, but I've led a very tame and uninteresting life. I see one of the drawers was broken into. Very amateurish. Yes, that lock is completely damaged. I've, I've moved everything to this side of the desk. Just a moment, I'll find my key, and yes. And here it is. The Musgrave Ritual. Ah. Huh. Curious old writing. It dates back to... Well, Charles I, I should say. You can tell by the spelling. Probably Charles II. My ancestor, Ralph Musgrave, was a prominent cavalier and the right-hand man in Charles' wanderings. They went for that sort of rigmarole in those days, and... Yeah, it's just a series of questions and answers. Uh, probably the bywords of a secret society. You know the answers by heart, I take it. Yes, it's something that every Musgrave has to learn. Suppose I read off the questions, and you give me the answers. Fire away. You can't trip me up there. All right. Here goes. Whose was it? His who is gone. Who shall have it? He who will come. 
Where was the sun? Over the oak. Where was the shadow? Under the elm. How was it stepped? North by ten and by ten. East by five and by five. South by two and by two. West by one and by one. And so under. Hmm. What shall we give for it? All that is ours. And why shall we give it? For the sake of the trust. As you see, Holmes, the paper has no practical importance. On the contrary, it has tremendous practical importance. Your butler seems to have been a very clever fellow. He has had more insight than ten generations of his masters. I say, Holmes. The oak, I take it, is the one that stands here, to the east of the house. I noticed it as I drove up. That's right. You can see it from this window. Yes, yes. Quite a patriarch. It must have been here when the ritual was drawn up. It was there at the Norman Conquest, in all probability. Listen, there is someone in the hallway outside. Eavesdropping. I'm sure of it this time. I'll soon find out. Hello. Why, it's Rachel. My dear girl, whatever you're doing up and about like this, where is your nurse? She... She's sleeping. I fooled her. You must go right back to bed. Yes, I must go right back. He's gone. Yes, of course. Breton's gone. He's gone, I say. Yes, yes, I, I know that. Now, don't worry. We'll find him for you. Just, just go back. You'll never find him. Never. I know where he's gone. Yes? He's gone where he belongs. Well, where is that? To hell. He's gone to hell. <laughs> I say, she's delirious. Help me get her upstairs, will you? We'll have to postpone our talk, I'm afraid. Yes. There's nothing more to do until tomorrow morning, in any case. What do you mean, tomorrow morning? When the sun is over the oak. That's what he said. And now he's gone. Gone. <laughs> In just a moment, we will rejoin Sherlock Holmes as he endeavors to solve the mystery of the Musgrave ritual. Good morning, Holmes. I hope you haven't been too bored prowling around the grounds by yourself. Sorry to have kept you waiting. Uh, fact is... I'm a bit upset. There's been another disappearance. Rachel eluded her nurse again last night, and so far she hasn't been found. So I understand. Your butler told me. I've traced her footprints to the edge of this lake. But the lake is over eight feet deep at this point. Oh, the poor, demented girl. I took the liberty of ordering the drags and grappling hooks at once. Yes, uh, I see the men working. Have you found... Nothing. Exactly nothing. Hello. There seems to be some excitement now. The drags have caught on something. We've got her, sir. We've got her this time for sure. Pull hard, boys. That's right. Oh, what a frightful business. Hello. Why, it's not a body. No. It's a large canvas bag. Here, boys. Give it to me. Aye, sir. What's in it? Just a minute. Don't slosh it around. Why, it's just a lot of old discolored metal and some dull-colored pebbles or glass. Ah, throw it back. Stop. Better keep that stuff. Bring it along and don't let it out of your hands. Now let's get back to the house. Oh, breakfast, eh? No, no, breakfast will have to be postponed. The sun is now over the oak. Oh, I say, Holmes, you're not taking that rubbish seriously. The only thing that puzzles me is the absence of our ancient elm tree. Well, sorry to disappoint you. There are plenty of elderly beeches, uh, won't they do? No, I'm afraid not. Mm. Wait a minute. There used to be an elm. Very ancient it was, too. Right over there, you can still see the stump. It was cut down when I was about 15. Midway between the house and the oak. Yes, that must have been the one. I suppose it's impossible to find out how tall it was. Uh, not at all. It was 64 feet. Excellent. 
But how in God's name did you... Th that tree was my tutor's favorite exercise in trigonometry. Now then, the shadow of the oak is fairly obvious. We can see that for ourselves. But the shadow of the elm is a bit more difficult. I say, Holmes, what are you doing with that fishing rod? A fishing rod of six feet throws a shadow of... Let me see. Nine feet, exactly. Quite simple. Therefore, a tree of 64 feet will throw a shadow of 96 feet. And in the same direction... Where's my tape? Ah, yes. 96 feet. 96, yes. Ah, here we are. I must say, Holmes, that's very neat. That's just the beginning, my dear fellow. Just the beginning. North 10 and 10. 10 steps by each foot, I think that means... That takes you parallel to the well of the old wing of the house. Marked with a peg. Now, five to the east. Yes. And two to the south. I say, it takes you right to that old unused door. The old unused door has been used quite recently. The surrounding ivy is all torn. Yes, by Jove. It's even unlocked. How long since this wing has been inhabited? Oh, not for several generations the oldest part of the house, built in the 16th century, I should say. And nowadays, it's only used to store things in. Hmm. Open the door. Two paces to the west obviously means two paces down this flagstone passage. Well, this must be the place indicated by the ritual. What are you tapping on the stones for? All firmly cemented together. Not even a hollow sound. See, I told you it was all balderdash. Hold on. Hold on. And so under. I nearly forgot that one. Is there a cellar under this place? Yes, it's as old as the house. Lead me to it. That's where our search ends. Very well. But what are we searching for? Careful. Steps here. It's pretty dark. That's it. This is a cellar. We store wood down here sometimes. Hello, it's all been moved aside. What's this? What's this? It's Brunton's scarf. And what has the villain been doing down here? Just as I thought. Look here, this piece of wood. It's been used to prop up something heavy. See how both ends are flattened? Look, his scarf is attached to this iron ring set in a flagstone. Quite sizable flagstone, eh? He must have had someone to help him. He couldn't raise that by himself. You mean Branton? Yes. He was after the buried treasure. He probably talked Rachel into assisting him. That's how she happened to be in possession of the bag she threw into the lake. I don't understand what you're talking about. Hmm. Uh, I can't budge it. Lend a hand, will you, Musgrave? Rachel. Uh, there it comes. Quick. Prop it up with that piece of wood. That's it. My Joe. It's a small room down there. And there, on the side, what is that? That, my dear Musgrave, is what Brunton was after. Come on, let's go down. A brass wooden box, all covered in dust and worm-eaten. The lid has been thrown back. Look here, Holmes. I, I thought you expected to find considerable treasure. All this trunk contains is a few discolored discs of metal. Old coins, apparently. I say, do you think that rascal Brunton has been here and robbed me? That was his intention, undoubtedly. But I don't think he succeeded. Why not? The, the box is empty. Because I think I see his feet sticking out from behind the box. Here, help me move it. It's Brunton, all right. He's dead. Quite. Suffocated, I fancy. This cubbyhole isn't very large. But how did it happen? He was murdered on the second night, after you discovered him in the library. I can reconstruct the scene fairly easily from the data we have on hand. Rachel's condition, the bag found in the lake, the open door, the scarf, and the piece of wood used as a prop. It is the very last which is particularly significant. He had talked Rachel into assisting him. Realizing that the girl was still infatuated, they waited until everyone had gone to bed, then stole down here. It was a stormy night, I believe. 
That's it. Close the door after you. Now, light the lantern. That's better. Blimey. For the luck. Don't look like that, Rachel. Nothing's gonna happen to you, yeah? I'm afraid. Do you think we ought? What's the matter with you? If I'd have known that you'd had no more spunk in you than this, well, I'd, I'd have asked someone else, yeah? I thought you said you loved me. I do. You know I do. I'd do anything for you. Come along, then. Down this stairway now. Easy. But it, it's stealing. Stealing? To take something from a man he doesn't even know he has, he'll never miss it. But it is, not ours. What of it? He hasn't had the sense to find it, has he? I'm the only one with enough brains for that, yeah? Think I want to spend the rest of me life waiting on them that ain't as good as I am? We'll have the money. We'll be rich, yeah? Why do you think I didn't marry you before? Because I wasn't making enough. Think I'm gonna starve myself to keep a wife? Th then you will marry me, if, if we find it. Here's the ring. Wait, I'll put my skull through it. But you will marry me. You must. I haven't told you before because I didn't want to worry you, but... Folks are beginning to suspect, and I hey, Just stop your blabbering and get this scoff, yeah? Now then, pull. Pull on it. It's so heavy. A lot of use you are to a man. Pull on it, I tell you. Ah, there she comes. Quick, shove that piece of wood under you. Why, there's a truck down there. Of course. And I'm gonna find what's in it. Stop trembling, you fool. You're shaking the lantern. You will marry me, won't you? It's dusty down here. Whew. Hey, there's even a key in the lock. Up goes the lid. <laughs> well, well, well. That's more like it. You will marry me. Here. Yeah. Put this stuff in the canvas bag I brought along. Careful, you ninny. Don't drop it. That's right. Now, now, give me a hand. Help me out of here. You, you haven't answered me. You are going to marry me, aren't you? <laughs> marry you? <laughs> what kind of fool do you take me for? Marry a girl like you that lets a fellow... <laughs> Don't laugh. Don't laugh. How do I know I'm the only lover you've had, eh? A wench like you. I hate you. I hate you. I hate the sight of you. I don't ever want to see you again. Oi, what are you doing with that piece of wood? Look out, you ninny. You'll pull it out. Don't you? He wouldn't marry me. He, he wouldn't marry me. He, he wouldn't marry me. He wouldn't marry me. I say, Holmes, what a cad he must have been. But what did Brunton find that he considered so valuable? The contents of that bag. This old rubbish? Why, the metal is almost as black and dull looking as these stones. Try rubbing one of them. That reddish one, for instance. Right, oh. I say. I say, it does develop quite a sparkle. Quiet. I imagine that stuff was left in your ancestor's possession by the royal party on the death of Charles I. I congratulate you on its discovery. It is of great intrinsic value, but of even greater importance as a historical curiosity. Why? What is it, then? It is nothing less than the ancient crown of the kings of England. That's an exciting discovery, Dr. Watson. How did it happen that Charles II never recovered his crown? That is the one point that Holmes was unable to clear up. It's likely that the Musgraves who held the secret died in the interval, and by some oversight left this guide to his descendants without explaining the meaning of it. Dr. Watson will be back in just a moment to tell us about next week's adventure. And now, what story are we to have next week, Dr. Watson? Suppose I tell you the one Holmes calls The Adventure of the Three Garadets. 
Garadabs. What on earth are Garadabs? <laughs> it's a family name, Miss Manning. And the story is concerned with a gentleman called Garadab, who wished to find others of the same name, for rather curious reasons. You have been listening to a Sherlock Holmes adventure, adapted from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Musgrave Ritual, with Matt Van Steenberg as Sherlock Holmes and Kyle Frank as Dr. Watson. The dramatization was directed by Ace Rockwell. This program is presented by Mortar and Pestle Productions, Sundays at the same time, and is sponsored by the makers of... Insert product name here. This is Alfonso Bernschnark speaking. Maestro, let's have that theme again. And now would be a capital time to give a big thank you to all our patrons and sponsors whose efforts and donations make this and other programs like it possible. Want to make a donation? You can help to fund future radio and digital productions. Visit our website, www mortarandpestleproductions.com Once again, that's www.mortarandpestleproductions.com to find out more. Want to get involved? We are always accepting content submissions, resumes for talent, and production volunteers at getinvolvedm&p at gmail.com Of course, you can tune in to find all the burning answers to your burning questions about love and its mysteries on our new program, Sex Trades, with our friend, certified sex and relationship expert, Jacqueline, of all trades. Have a question about the birds and bees, or wondering why your sweetie won't hold your hand anymore? Ask Jacqueline. There's only one way to find out. Episode 1 is coming soon to this channel in podcast form and video show format on the MNP After Dark YouTube channel. Subscribe now to keep in the know. This radio presentation has been a socially distanced production. Its participants recorded remotely and mixed at MNP headquarters here in Toronto. Be sure to tune in to the MMP Podcast channel for new episodes. Coming up in two weeks' time will be part one of Macbeth. MMP Podcast can be found on iTunes, Anchor, Spotify, and YouTube. Please subscribe to show your support and make more original programming possible. Thanks for listening. Stay safe, stay tuned, and good night. <laughs>